We're delighted and honored to have this spirited Ginger Catherine, my friend and horse advocate, present in our museum to enlighten us and educate us about the history of the prior horse herd. So without any further ado, again, thank you all, and here's Ginger. <laughs> introduction compared to how colorful this woman is. <laughs> We've had some adventures in the prior mountains together um, and uh, it started out with Patty having her broken ATV and it ended with hiding in a ravine in a lightning storm on top of the prior mountain. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought I was going to die. <laughs> 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 um, Anyway, I'm, I'm a, a natural history filmmaker. I'm not a historian. And I'm um, a little uh, nervous about being here with people who truly are more historians than I am. A natural history filmmaker films the natural world and tries to reflect um, reality about their surroundings. And so I'm a little, um, a little out of my element here. Do most of you know how the Prior Mountains got their name? Somebody does. A few of you do. Um, back in uh, 1806, Lewis and Clark went on their expedition westward, uh, largely on the waterways. And uh, on their way back in 1806, they wanted to bring horses back with them to trade for food uh, on the Missouri River. And they put a man named Sergeant Pryor in charge of the horse herd. And there's arguments about how big that horse herd was. Some, some I've, I've read it, as few as 17 and as many as 50. But in any case, they came, of course, overland. They're not going to take them down the river. So Lewis and Clark went down the river, and Sergeant Pryor and two corporals went with him. And they encamped on what's the backside of the escarpment. Um, for the Big Vision Quests are back in there in the Pryor Mountains. And uh, they went to bed. This is Sergeant Pryor's story. And in the morning they got up and all the horses were gone. They'd all been stolen. Sergeant Pryor said they were stolen by the Crow Indians. Now I checked uh, up with Joe Medicine Crow on this. And I, sa I said, here's what, I've, here's what I've read about the Crow stealing the horses. And Joe said, it was somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> so in any case, it, it put the expedition in a little bit of a bind because they didn't have uh, their horses to trade for food um, on their return visit. And uh, Lewis and Clark were both uh, not happy about the whole thing. Um, the Bighorn Basin that we're on the edge of here um, was the cradle of evolution for wild horses back in the Eocene, millions and millions and millions of years ago. And that was little, what we learned in school, little Eohippus. Uh, anymore, they call it Hyrocatherium, and it was about 15 inches tall. So about the same height as my terrier. And uh, had multiple toes and ate plants because the Bighorn Basin wasn't the Bighorn Basin then. It was forested and rich and lush and lots of trees and lots of big scary predators too. And over time, uh, Eohippus uh, grew in a different way because the climate changed. And I guess we can react to that, can't we? Um, the climate became much, much drier and the forest gave way to open grasslands. And it wouldn't do to be a multi-toed 15-inch little guy. And so as the climate dried up everything and, and we got all these wonderful grasslands, um, little Eohippus grew to be a solid hooked horse. And uh, I was lucky enough um, when I was doing uh, some work on the history of a horse, it was my uh, pleasure to go to British Columbia and I visited with the man who had discovered the first solid hooked horse to be identified in British Columbia. That horse lived up to just a few thousand years ago. 
So that's how much we are the cradle of evolution of these fabulous animals. In 1994, uh, Marty Stauffer, who was the producer of the Wild America series, do anybody remember? Enjoy our wild America. <laughs> and um, he hired me as a researcher on his program. And back in 87, I think I started as a researcher and a writer and an editor for that half hour series on the PBS. He never let me shoot anything. Uh, he said, that, well, girls don't shoot. <laughs> <laughs> Marty was just a real good old boy from Arkansas. <laughs> and um, in 1990 and 1991, um, I did a film called Spirits of the Rainforest, which was a two-hour special for uh, the Discovery Channel. And that program ended up winning Best Documentary of the Year and the Emmy Awards. And about a week after the Emmy Awards, Marty called me on the phone. And he said, um, I always wanted to do a film about wild horses. Would, would you shoot it for me? I think he said Mustangs when he said it. You always do a film about Mustangs for me. And will you shoot it? I don't know whatever happened to girls don't shoot. I guess an Emmy Award changed his mind. I, I mean, this man, who I dearly love, and he gave me the opportunity of a lifetime, of course, to work in natural history, um, he really did believe that I could get uh, cold. And he said this to me, you could get wet. <laughs> you could get cold. You could get lost. But all that kind of went out the window. And when he asked me to do a film about Mustangs, I thought, oh, my big opportunity to shoot a film about animals that do nothing of interest. <laughs> it was a natural history series. It was based on behavior. Well, I knew that horses didn't do anything. <laughs> I grew up on a farm in Ohio, and I had a pal and a quarter horse, and he was really nice. He was really pretty. And he didn't do anything interesting. <laughs> he dumped me a few times. But I really was worried. And so I started to load up the storyline about history. And that, that gave me just an inkling of the rich history of, of horses in North America. But nothing about behavior. I could not find anything that had been written about wild horse behavior. And so my sister and I took a trip out, out west. She's from Ohio, and that's where I grew up, in Bowling Ohio. And we took a trip, uh, a location scouting trip, it's called. That's to kind of go get a sense of where would be a good place to film. And since it was a history project, we went all the way to the Nez Perce Reservation, and we lined up all the historic recreations of horse thieving, of uh, breeding of the Appaloosa horse, um, and the first horses that came, um, the man in the shiny shoes coming from southern Colorado, the base of the, of the mountains, and the Sangre de Cristos, where my ranch is. So I thought, well, this is good. This is good. I have something to fill, you know, fill a half hour, maybe, of, <laughs> of, of time. And you know, a friend of mine who was in Arizona um, said, you know, a good place might be the Fire Mountains. You might want to check that out because it's got a paved highway in there and the horses have seen people. Because when my sister and I went on our big location scouting trip, all we saw was butts and dust. <laughs> and I thought, great, they don't do anything interesting and can't even get close enough to get profiles or nice shots of them. Um, and a, a, a Lutheran minister named Reverend Floyd Schweiger, who some of you may have known, uh, took Marion and I out on the dry head, and the horses didn't run away. It wasn't all butts and dust. They continued grazing. I thought, great. I already knew that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I knew that that was all they did. And. Um, we learned about a newborn foal that had been born. Reverend Schreeder said he'd come out the next morning, he'd pick us up, and he'd take us out to this other area of the 
the horse range. And he'd pick us up in the morning, but he had to preach, uh, and so he'd have to come after church at noon. So Marianne and I um, started asking some questions of motel owners and how you got out there and so forth. And we, uh, we got up before dawn, so it was dark outside, and we started driving with a dry head. And then we took all those cryptic directions, you know, don't go straight, the tillets look there, and they carry guns. <laughs> uh, you know, when you go with, when you go with the cattle guard, don't, don't go straight, turn right. And the, the very last instruction was at dawn, um, it, it was starting to get light. We found what they said was the last right-hand turn, the old tractor. Right. Now, for those of you who've been in that prior, you know the old tractor, don't you? So we turned right into the old tractor. It was still not quite light. It was starting to get light. And um, we drove maybe a mile down. And I looked to my right, and there was a stallion eating snow at the base of a red view. I think it's snow. It's snow. That's a great behavior. And I parked the, the car, and I got my big boat anchor, the tripod out. The Patty knows how much it weighs. She's carried it before. And, and a big long lens about this long, you know, and I started filming this beautiful black horse eating snow. And my sister got bored. She had on a white golf jacket. Good camo gear, right? She starts walking down the road because, you know, she got bored. Here I'm standing there filming this horse eating snow. He was about 100 yards away. And the horse looked up. Here's this white ball coming down the road. The sun had just crested over the big hard mountains. And there's my sister walking down the road. She's going to ruin my shot. And then I thought, or oh, she's going to get killed. <laughs> Here came this stallion. He was just a large His father, stallion. Raven, is their band leader. It's his job to defend the family and against. He stopped. And he stopped. And he snorted at her. And he. He, when he snorted, you could see the big white star under his long, long forearm. And he spun around and he raced away. And I thought, wow, this is great. And then when he was running, out of the shadows came his family and the newborn foal. <clears throat> that was my introduction <laughs> to the part of all horses. And I thought, I'll be back. And I'll be back to see you. I learned his name was Raven. And he taught me what it meant to be a wild horse. All their wonderful behaviors. It was absolutely fantastic. But this is all about history, right? Not behavior. And all of my films are about behavior and very little about history. So I'm very happy to be able to show you this 30-minute film. It contains interviews with some wonderful people. Beginning in 2002, um, I, I interviewed Reverend Schweiger formally, so he could tell me what he told me on that first drive into the dry head. And I filmed with uh, Mike Penfold and Howard Brodus and others that you're going to see. And um, why don't we start this, Jesse? Sure. And we'll see how it goes. But it's about 30 minutes long, and it's all history. Well, it wasn't so long ago. We almost lost the, the whole herd up there, wasn't it? Not too long ago. Yeah, it was around 1962, I think that uh, we became quite aware of the fact that uh, not only here, but in many places, they were going to get rid of the wild horses because, well, it's, it's a, it was a natural problem because they brought cattle and sheep and they eat grass and the wild horses ate grass and so there was a natural conflict. It was best and simplest just simply to get rid of the wild horses because as a lot of people said, well, what good are they? But uh, then in 1900 and uh, 
1971, the Wild Horse and Burrow Act was passed. And uh, it's, it's important to note that the Prior Mountain Wild Horse Range was the first wild horse range that was established. And this was established three years before the Wild Horse and Burrow Act was right. passed. That's right. So there were a lot of local people here who acted long before some of the other things. Yeah. What makes these horses different than most other wild horses? Well, there are three things usually. One of them is the amount of time that these animals have been on that location. For instance, uh, we can verify the fact that the prior horses have been in the prior mountains for at least 125 years. And there are several modern day scientists who believe it's closer to 200 mm -hmm. years. So they've been up there a long time. And that tends to signal that they're a little bit different from other more modern day type of horses. Then the, the second thing that you notice is their, their color, their conformation, and, and the like. Their size, uh, too. Their right? size, yeah, absolutely. The average size of the prior horses is about 14 hands high. They have the primitive colors, the dun factor horses, and the primitive markings. Is the dorsal line down their back, they have the tiger stripes on their legs. These colts uh, really express that. Yes, they, very, they very much so. Yeah. They're some of the most pronounced tiger stripes that you will see on horses today. And they've also <clears> done um, blood testing, right? How does oh, that? Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, we've had over 300 of the Prior Mountain horses blood type by the University of Kentucky, the mm -hmm. genetics department. Mm -hmm. And uh, their evaluation is simply that these horses go back to the old Spanish type of animals, and they are perhaps most closely related to the uh, Spanish Paso Fino horses mm -hmm. uh, of today. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Prior Mountain horses are more of the northern type of a Spanish type horse, and these animals are a little bit heavier boned than what they, they are, are in the southwest. Yeah. yeah, they are. These are also descendants, perhaps, are they not, of Crow Indian horses? Yeah, uh, we often like to refer to them as colonial uh, Spanish-American horses, but you could as well refer to them as the old original Indian, Crow Indian ponies. And I say the old original uh, Crow Indian ponies because the uh, Spanish-type horses came up through the Indian nations and got up into the prior mountains about 1730, somewhere mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. vicinity. Uh, a BLM historian by the name of uh, Daniel Harvey compiled the history of the Priors, and in it he has an account of uh, uh, a Charles O. Williamson being a, a forest ranger up on the Priors. And he says at that time, this was in the 1920s. This was in the 1920s, and it was about at that time that Joe Medicine Crow tells us that the uh, federal government and some of the large ranchers exterminated about 50,000 horses. At least that's what Joe Medicine Crow says. He was and a boy. He, he was a boy then. about nine years old mm -hmm. at the time, and. He says that it was much the same as after the buffalo were exterminated. Uh, people came in there with wagons and loaded up the bones, I imagine, for their calcium and just literally uh, uh, wagon loads of uh, horse bones were taken out of, of that country. A fellow by the name or Charles Williamson uh, who was a ranger up on the priors tells of there being about 70 of these little Spanish type horses uh, up in the priors at that time. And uh, one of the historians of the Crows, Joe Medicine Crow, also tells of the fact that about that time, uh, about 1920, 24, mm -hmm. in there, hundreds 
Uh, in fact, thousands of crow horses were slaughtered. Knowing the priors and knowing the little uh, canyons and crags and things like that, the horses that the crows had at that time were the same as the colonial Spanish-American horses. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I believe that the horses that we have today is just a remnant herd of those original colonial Spanish horses which the crows had. Mm -hmm. And so really you can say it either way that these are colonial Spanish-American horses or they are crow Indian horses. If you could tell me in a very short way what happened to the Crow Indian horses? In 1919, the non-Indian livestock men who were leasing and renting our rangeland complained that the Crows own too many horses and they're eating up their good grass. And they want the government to get rid of the Crow horses. And by 1922, the Secretary of Interior ordered the extermination of Crow horses. And uh, one of the local ranchers organized a, a, a roundup outfit, so to speak. We call them wagons, to go around killing horses. But it was too big a task. So <clears throat> they went down, this man Shirky went down to Texas and brought some Texas gunmen, and then they started in. So during in one summer, they killed about 40,000 head of horses on the Crow Indian Reservation. By fall of 1923, around there, the program was in it, and that was that. But the second phase took place uh, about five years later when the bones were collected by bone collectors who would load the wagons and take the bones to Billings, Montana for fertilizer. And Phase three was after World War II, say 1950, around there. This same rancher, Matt Shirky, <clears throat> decided to get rid of the wild horses once and for all because there were some still roaming out there in a rough uh, <clears throat> area called Rotten Grass Breaks, real rough country. And they were there. And they stay there. Nobody can get them. But he <clears throat> got some helicopters, airplanes, and just ran them to death. When they get so tired they can't go on anymore, they stop and shoot them. So he got rid of them. 1923. Yes. 1922, I guess, is when the, the killing was started. How old were you? I was, uh, I was born in 1913, so I must be about 11, huh? Mm-hmm. What, did you participate in the, or did Yes, the... I was in one party. We started in Bighorn Mountains to bring horses to the little Bighorn Valley over here, about 25 miles or 30 miles, chasing wild horses this way, all the way. Took us about a week and brought in about 50 head of horses. But that was not to kill them. Huh? That was not to kill them. You sold them, right? Yeah. 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 We sold some that were not branded. So we, <laughs> after we got through, they, they gave me oh, two, three dollars. <laughs> 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 but there was lots of money. I, I bought a lot of ice cream cones. <laughs> so 40,000 horses were killed, and you said that the stench was just Terrible. awful. If we could maybe pick the story up there. All right. About five years after the extermination of the Crow Indian horses, about 40, 50,000 hit, there were dried bones all over the country, scattered all over the country. And uh, some white men came with wagons, loaded wagons, hundreds of wagons, loaded with bones and taken to buildings to fertilize the companies there. Now, Today, whenever I see bones, horse bones, lying around, I'm quite concerned. Bones of my brothers, just like bones of buffaloes. So 
whenever I find a, some bones, horse bones, along a trail where people can look at them and disturb them, I gather them up and uh, take them further in the hills and and uh, leave them there in a good uh, air place so, so that nobody would bother them. Eventually, they'll go back to uh, our Mother Earth. And here's some bones I just picked up not long ago, and uh, I'm going to put them away in a good way here with some prayers, maybe my horse song. <laughs> And the, uh, the question has always been asked me, well, where in the Prior Mountains are the horses and people who wanted to find them or locate them and so forth? And to that, I only have one general answer. The Prior Mountain horses are located all over the Prior Mountains. Uh, in those days, there were thousands of horses running all over the West. In fact, uh, there are two different accounts in Grable, Wyoming, in uh, 1920, of 5,000 horses being shipped out, wild horses. And again in 1940, another 5,000 wild horses were, were being shipped out of the country. So there were horses all over the place. In the area east of Warren, there were horses on those flats because the uh, people from the Red Lodge Zoo would come down. And I recall they're shooting several horses, loading them up on flatbed trailers and taking them back to uh, the Red Lodge Zoo and feeding their, uh, their cats and bears and other things with them. So uh, uh, there were horses on the Big Prior. When I first came here, it was common knowledge that the Lewis Sheep Estate uh, would tell their sheep herders to go out and shoot the stallions. That was the simplest way of keeping these horse herds uh, in numbers. So if you ask me, uh, where were there wild horses? Well, they were all over, except I would have to qualify that and say they were where there was water. Uh, in the winter time, of course, the horses uh, covered the entire range because they ate snow. But in the summertime, they usually stayed where there was water. Coincidentally, when the BLM did their interview on this whole matter, they asked only BLM and Park Service personnel. They didn't ask any local people. They asked uh, Bess Tillett, and they never did. I asked her, uh, did you ever see any horses west of that pole fence? And she said, well, I saw 15 beautiful flaxen mane and tail horses that were west of there. Now, if you know anything about the Prior Mountains, you know that there were an awful lot of flaxen mane and tail sorrel horses up there in the early days as were there a lot of red roans. But during the course of the various roundups, people would always want those horses, and so those horses were readily removed from the herd. But were there horses there? Yeah. Uh, I talked to Herman Kruger one time. He's the man who had, the, of course, the uh, private land up there, which later on he leased to uh, the BLM, and which also contains the Kruger Springs and is a source, a wonderful source of water for the horses today. And he says, too, the horses that he knew of that existed outside and west of that pool fence were always horses that were in the vicinity of, uh, of uh, Tony's Island. But I'll have to make one exception to the rule again. And that is if you drive up there even today, uh, you will see horses along that, uh, 
Dryad Overlook Road. But the reason for that is that right down below that road there are several potholes and uh, the horses will stay there as long as there is water available. But the minute the water is gone, they will go to Toadies Island or they will try to go to the big uh, ice cave, wherever they can find water. There were a, a group of animals on the south end of the West Prior Mountain. There, there are no horses, wild horses there now. They've moved them all off of that area, but that was the first ones I've seen. The first band of wild horses I saw was right up there. Linda and I went up in an old two-wheel drive pickup, old Ford pickup, and we had to put a bunch of rocks in the back end to, so we could get enough traction, get enough weight in the back end to get traction to get up there. <laughs> she probably, she won't ever go back with me again. <laughs> and then what about the horses? How does it feel to see them? It just makes me feel like I'm part of history to see those animals that have been here so many years and, and nobody cares for them, nobody feeds them, nobody has to do anything to them. And in the summertime, they're sleek and, and trim and, and well fed and their hooves are round and they look like they uh, been to a farrier or something to take care of them, but they're just naturally that way. They're hard rocks out there. They round them off themselves, and so they don't even need to be shod. Nature has adapted them to live in that particular area. The first time I knew about this particular herd of wild horses was back in the mid-60s, and uh, Reverend Swigger, Reverend Floyd Swigger, who was instrumental with a group of local people in saving the horses. The BLM wanted to get rid of them, the whole herd back in the mid-60s. And so they got a local effort going, and and that did pretty well. But then another lady got involved in the project, and that was Hope Ryden. At that time, she was a correspondent for ABC TV. And she got interested in the story and came out here to see if there was a story of national interest. And she determined that this was of national interest. And so she got published all over the country at that time and, and later all around the world about this particular herd and, uh, and that, that uh, the BLM wanted to get rid of them and they weren't really causing any harm or anything. I mean, you know, they were. They were just living out there in these mountains, and, and they, they had a, about a 50,000-acre range, not exactly that number, but something like that, and they weren't doing any harm. And so she, and along with Reverend Swigger, and a lot of children across the country and school children, are who I credit to saving these horses. You know, Howard, uh, uh, here it is, a snowy day out, out there, the first part of January, and I've already got cabin fever. I would love to get up to the priors, but, you know, I was looking over there um, uh, last week uh, from the Beartooth, and it's just solid blanket of snow, and I got to thinking, I wonder how those horses are doing over there. Three feet of snow is no, no problem to them, really, to survive in, you know, it's... But you know, they've done it for hundreds of years. I mean, uh, you take a horse that's down here from the, the paddock and the, and the range down below here where we feed them and we pamper them and we take care of them. Uh, these horses that we have down here would not survive one winter on the prior mountains. They most of the kids have horses then? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, they was, they was very few kids that, well, even town kids, I mean, you know, they, a lot of them, they didn't have horses, but, uh, you know, they, they knew the other kids that had the horses. So, I mean, really, everybody had a horse that he was riding pretty regular. You know, some of the things that was kind of funny, you know, when, when we were little kids there at Lodge Grass, we would, I can remember old Bull Weasel. He was old. Man of the Plains, I mean, you know, he is a warrior of the Plains. And old Bull Weasel, he'd ride his horse to town, and 
we had to always go over and tie it up to a light pole right behind old Pat Nichols' store underneath the apple tree. And he'd go into cards in, in, where they played cards and stuff like that, and sit around and watch them play cards and whatever, you know, and drink a little coffee and stuff throughout the day, you know. And he'd come out at night and he could, just could not understand why his old horse was just sitting there, just sprawled out, dead tired. <laughs> Forty kids had rode that poor horse all day. <laughs> so, so you know, like I say, you know, we horses was our was our, was our was our entertainment, and and miles meant nothing, or being gone for several days meant nothing. When you uh, rode up on the priors there, did you see ho wild horses up there at, at that time? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's actually what we went to the prior mountains for. Is, to see the horses, that was the biggest part of the biggest attraction for us was to go see the horses, you know, and then just to go go see what was over the hill and see what you know, see what the country was like over there and see what was there. I was reading some history, Howard, here a while back um, that I'd kind of forgotten. You know, the superintendent of of Indian Affairs, or the, uh, the tribal superintendent, then estimated there was 30,000 horses on the Crow Reservation back in 19, 1920s. And uh, at that time he said, you know, there's no problem with these horses. But in, in 1927, the, the BIA decided they didn't want you, guy, you mm -hmm. Indians having a bunch of horses. They wanted you having cattle. The Crow Indians had, like you say, somewhere between 30 and 40,000 head of horses on the reservation. In that, at that period of time, and then uh, the government uh, come in there and they put a bounty on horses. They sent people out there who were federal horse killers. I mean, that's all they was. They just went out, and that was their job every day was just to go out and shoot horses. And uh, they had other people. Uh, they they kind of stopped that, and then they. They put a, a, a three dollar bounty on a pair of ears. Two ears. Yeah, on two ears, and you know, at that time, even down by Lodge Grass and Wyola, where I lived down there, there was a lot of horses, and we called them crappies because somebody had went out and just cut their ears off and turned them loose, and they were still running around, but, but their ears was cut off, and somebody had sold the, the ears for the bounty. <laughs> so, you know, and we just called them crappies. You know, when you read back and, and, and study the history of the horses on the prior mountains, every rancher on the prior mountains, practically, I won't say everyone, but biggest share of the ranchers on the prior mountains claimed all of the horses on, on, on the prior mountains. Were, and they, were they branded, Howard? No. Yeah, not branded. They claimed the horses, and, and, and it was to protect the horses from the federal government killing them. Mm -hmm. but, they, but they claimed the horses. They said it, they were theirs. But yet, the, 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 when, when, when you sat down and you, and you talked to the rancher yourself, he would just tell you, they don't belong to nobody. Yeah, I think they were thoughtfully trying to preserve that uh, genetic pool of wild horses up there. I mean, I can't read it any other way. And, and, the, and the BLM just kept hounding them, hounding, get your, get your trespass horses off of there. And they'd say, well, those horses have been uh, uh, born up there, they've been raised up there, and we can't get them off of there. And uh, it's kind of interesting history. Shortly after I got the BLM here, I didn't realize it that there was any program to shoot horses. I couldn't hardly imagine that. And I had a, I had a high-level person come out from Washington, D.C., and I was having dinner with that person and one of my BLM employees. And he started talking about when they would go out with a 30 6 which he, was his job, mm -hmm. and shoot horses. Yep. And, 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 the, and the person that had come out from Washington was, was a horse, really liked horses, and... I looked over at her, and she was just absolutely turning white about, and, and he was talking about shooting these horses with the 30 out six and how they would scream when they hit them. And I mean, it was, I, mean, I, I said, George, I, I don't want to hear any more about this. 
And I, 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 it was just a piece of that BLM history I didn't want to hear about, but I mean, it's just pretty, pretty, mm -hmm. dis pretty bad. And, you know, when you talk to about the, the history and you talk to the, to, to the old ranch people who lived over there in that country, they'll talk, they'll talk, they'll, they'll tell you all of the stories about how the wild horses was way down on Crooked Creek. Yeah. Uh, way out on them points, out there, all, all of that. Uh, they were over on Big Prior, too. Yeah, over on that uh, Forest Service land, all that their land was all covered with horses. Uh, there was horses on 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 on, uh, on the Big Prior Mountain. There was on what we call Red Mountain, and uh, there's horses that were plumb over on Little Mountain, which is just still just just out of Prior, a, f a few miles. And that there's uh, on the north side of the north or west side of the Prior Gap. Uh, I, and I've got to take some responsibility too. When I was state director here, I was responsible for those horses up on the priors. Uh, we, did, we did a plan uh, for, I, uh, I think it was signed shortly after I left, but I was here while that plan was being developed. And we, you know, we only lo were looking at saving 130 horses up there, adult horses. Mm -hmm. And um, that time I, we didn't have the kind of good genetic work that shows the, the, the special quality, the gene pool that we've got up there that needs to be preserved. And we didn't have the geneticists telling us, look at guys, you need to get a bigger herd than that to preserve this, this kind of a, a gene pool. Now that's kind of an excuse, but now we do know that. And I, it bothers me that we can't seem to get a, a good preservation program going for those horses. We need to get cooperation from the Forest Service. They just want to get rid of those horses. They're just like they were in 1923, for crying out loud. And uh, that bothers me because if you, if you ask the public what's the most important thing about those prior mountains, there'd be a number of things, but right at the very top of the list is probably going to be those horses. And, uh, and that's the right value. That's a gene pool that can't be uh, duplicated anywhere. It's the highest percentage of the old, year old Indian ponies that, that uh, exist in the United States. Those horses have been managing themselves for decades and decades, hundreds of years. And uh, man hasn't been telling, uh, telling this stud he's got to breed with that mare. They've been deciding that themselves. Yeah. And that's why those are horses are so tough. And um, uh, it, it, it is a, a, a goal that I have, certainly, is to try to get that pasture enlarged so that we can have enough of those horses to protect that gene pool. You know, we, if we would just give the wild horses back that Forest Service land, it's over there on Crooked Creek. Then the pasture up there would take care of more than 200 horses fairly easy. You know, Howard, what you're talking about? You're talking about freedom. You're talking about the freedom you had as a young man yeah. in, a, in, a, in a wonderful piece of country. And why in the world can we not figure out how to let these horses be free? Yeah. I mean, is that not something as Americans we would want to see? These, think of the history that these horses have meant to us, to you as an Indian person, yeah. and to us as, as, uh, as immigrants to this country. We, we owe something to horses, and why can't we have a few of them that are free? Uh, I, I, I believe that there is times that, uh, that the, probably the, the prior mountain wild horse, horses probably ranged all the way down towards Fort Smith along the Bighorn River, uh, uh, through the canyon, over the top of the Pryor Mountains, uh, Little Mountain. Oh, yeah. I know that they was on Little Pryor Mountains right out of Pry the town of Pryor. Uh, you and I both agree, Howard, because we've looked, we've been all over that country up there and we've watched these wild horses now. That, we, that pasture needs to be enlarged. And they need to be able to get back to the National Forest land where they've been for decades and decades. And um, if we don't have a large pasture, larger pasture, you know, the BLM will say, well, the grass is too short, we're going to have to cut down the, the, the number of horses again. So we must figure out a way to get, get those pastures enlarged and get them back into the area that they've been brought up in in years past and have always enjoyed. We need more grazing up there to get the numbers up where we've got a gene pool that's 
safe and secure. Yeah. <laughs>